everybody. Thanks for tuning in to another week of one um, on Instagram and Facebook Live. Yeah, we're going to start worship. So we encourage you to join us and stand up wherever you are and worship the Lord with us.
So, as I was saying earlier, the Bible is full of amazing stories of Jesus and his forgiveness. And one of the stories in the Bible relates to what I just said. It involves a person in the Bible who we only know as the woman. We don't know her name. We don't know much about her. But it's in John uh, 8, 1 through 11. And this is in the Gospel of John, the story of Jesus. And in this story, we encounter this woman. One of the most amazing stories in the Bible. The woman was caught in the act of adultery. What that means is, in layman's term, she was having a sexual relationship with somebody that wasn't her husband, with somebody else's husband. She was caught in that act doing that. Okay, and we don't know how many times she did that, with how many men she did that. We don't know anything about that. We just know that she was caught in the act of adultery. And that had really serious consequences back in the Bible times. There was laws against that. It said if you did that and you were caught, you and the person that did that will be executed. Your mistake would lead to your death and the death of the person that you did that with. Okay? So this is the story. There's a woman that's caught in this and these religious leaders grab this woman and bring him, or excuse me, bring her up to Jesus and try to trap Jesus in some kind of trick, in some kind of way that they can nail him for blasphemy or hypocrisy or something. They try to nail Jesus using this woman and her, her mistake, her sin. The, ver the verse goes on to say, religious leaders came up to Jesus and they said, teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Okay, and when they say to stone her, they, they meant to pick up rocks and throw them at her and kill her. The law of Moses, the law was, was defined to say, if you get caught doing this, you're going to be killed by having rocks thrown at you. Can you imagine how she felt in that moment? And Jesus didn't say anything. He just sat there. He was kind of kneeling down in the dust, and he was drawing or writing something in the dust. It doesn't say what he was drawing or writing, but he, he just kept moving his finger through the dust. They kept pleading with him, Jesus, what do you have to say? Come on, Jesus, what do you have to say? And they were just trying to trap him in something. Finally, he answered, and his answer is, is mind-blowing. He said, this is Jesus speaking, he said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Now Jesus knew, Jesus is God in the flesh. He knew that they had all sinned. Every single one of them had sinned. So now they're starting to think, they're starting to consider themselves in this, in this mess. The, the verse goes on and continues to say this. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one. They dropped their rocks one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. One by one, these men dropped the rocks from oldest to youngest, because the older people knew, I lived my whole life, 70, 80 years. I have a lot of sin. I can't throw the rock. So they got down to the youngest person that was accusing, and he dropped his rock, and the, the crowd of accusers walked away. Walked away. I don't know if the woman knew this yet, but Jesus spoke to her then. He stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? Didn't even one of them condemn you? And that means that either one of them say, you know, condemn means to put you to death. No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. What an amazing, amazing story of love, of forgiveness, of deliverance in that amazing act, in that amazing moment. Jesus is saying, 
I'm not going to condemn you. I, I basically forgive you. That's what he's, he's communicating. I love you and I forgive you. But he didn't excuse her sin. He didn't say, hey, that was, that was great. Uh, I'm going to free you from this moment of sin. Just don't get caught again. Or keep doing what you're doing, but don't let anybody see. He said, no, go and sin no more. He acknowledged the sin that she was doing. And he said, don't do that anymore. And I believe that in that moment, she was delivered. And I believe in that moment, she realized that Jesus was the Messiah, was the Savior. And I believe in that moment, she was transformed. Her life was completely transformed. Imagine you did something that was going to lead to your death, and they were ready to execute you. A guy walks up to you, gets everybody to leave, forgives you, and says, go and sin no more. Wouldn't your life be amazingly transformed by that love and that forgiveness in that moment if that happened to you? That's amazing to think about. Now, we don't know what happened to this woman. Again, she's, she's not mentioned any further in the Bible. She's not mentioned by name. But some scholars believe that she might be Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene uh, was a troubled woman, had a lot of stuff going on in her life, and Jesus delivered her. Jesus helped her from her, her messed up life, from her mistakes, and he forgave her. And she became one of his disciples, and she was with him to the very end. She was right there at the cross with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with John, when Jesus was crucified, Mary Magdalene was right there. Mary Magdalene was also at the open grave and was the first person to see Jesus alive, the, fir the first follower to see Jesus alive. So Mary Magdalene's life was majorly transformed. I wouldn't be surprised if this is the same person, if this is Mary Magdalene. Her life was transformed. We can imagine that this, this woman caught in adultery and freed and forgiven, her life was transformed too. And maybe she followed Jesus and didn't, didn't let that go to waste. She didn't return to adultery. She didn't return to sin, but she lived for God from that point on. She had a new life from that point on because of the love and the forgiveness that Jesus extended to her at that moment. It's an amazing story. And, and like I think there's books written about this. It's such an amazing story. But a lot of people might say, well, you know, that happened 2,000-something years ago. It's in the Bible. What? Okay, cool. What about now? Does stuff like this happen now? And I will tell you that it absolutely does happen. The love of God, the forgiveness of God is moving in this world and, and is being extended now. And there's stories about that. And so right now, I want to, we're going to lower the lights, and we are going to play you a video of an amazing story of something that happened. It's a true story. Like I said, the true stories to me are the greatest stories. This is a true story of somebody and a crazy thing happened and it got even crazier as, as it went on. So just listen to this amazing story. It's a familiar scene. Loved ones reuniting at the airport. It's a familiar scene, loved ones reuniting at the airport. But Gary Jarstfer and Shannon Etheridge aren't related at all. In fact, the strong bond they share was born from tragic circumstances. It was August 1984. The day started out just like any other. Shannon grabbed her books and pom-poms and rushed out the door for school. But Shannon never made it to school that day. I drove about a mile and a half down the road, and I remembered that I needed to put lipstick on. And I adjusted my rearview mirror for a quick application, and um, my car just jolted suddenly. And I thought that maybe I had hit a farm animal out of its pasture or something that was way out in the country. I ran back to see what I had hit and was absolutely in shock to be standing over the body of a curly-headed woman lying face down in the grass with a mangled bicycle next to her. Shannon ran to a house in the distance to call 911, but it was too late. The woman she'd hit was dead. I just kept thinking about the ripple effects you know, that this accident would have in so many people's lives. I was really thinking about how hard this was going to be for her family. 
Later at home, the sinking realization of what she'd done set in. I didn't know that I could cry that many tears. And there it just didn't seem to be any relief in sight. Shannon's thoughts moved away from her own grief to thoughts of the victim's family. I started thinking that someone else's mother, and how am I going to face her children? And that that's someone else's wife, and how am I going to face her husband? Those questions would be answered shortly. The woman Shannon killed was Marjorie Jarstfer. Her husband Gary was away at work when he received word of her death. There were thoughts that were going through my mind. Uh, what would Marjorie do if it, if it was me? And uh, what would be her response? And uh, I knew that she is a, was a very compassionate lady, so I, I knew that compassion had to be part of that. And uh, uh, how, how am I going to handle this? First, Gary decided there would be no lawsuits and no charges filed against the 16-year-old girl. Then he decided he wanted to meet her to extend forgiveness face to face. One of the things that the Lord was impressing on my mind when I was making that trip from McKinney back is, you know, I have forgiven you much. How could you not forgive? And so that was the, my, my premise or the, the thing that was pushing me to, to meet with Shannon and forgive her because I'd been forgiven. So how could you not forgive? The night before Marjorie's funeral, Shannon went to meet Gary. I took one step inside the entry door and I saw Gary down the hallway and he came running toward me, not with animosity in his eyes at all, but with his arms open wide. I just went and put my arms around her and hugged her and told her I forgave her. Gary also shared about his wife's relationship with the Lord. He said, I don't want you to let this ruin your life. He said, Shannon, God wants to use you through this. He said, as a matter of fact, I'm passing Marjorie's legacy of being a godly woman onto you. He said, I want you to learn to love Jesus without limits the way that Marjorie did. Shannon was raised in the church and baptized when she was 12 years old. But up to this point, she wasn't really living a Christian lifestyle. I was a 16-year-old girl, sexually active with my boyfriend, rebelling against my parents. But I thought that I was a Christian because I went to church and I was the president of my youth group. But I didn't recognize that, that yes, Jesus was my Savior, but he was not the Lord of my life. She realized the God Gary was telling her about was wonderful and so different from the God she thought she knew. I had seen a side of God through Gary Jarsper that I had never recognized before. I always saw God as just this distant disciplinarian, who's ready to strike me down if I committed one sin too many. But because of Gary's actions toward me, I now envisioned God as just this loving, unconditionally merciful God who was ready to scoop me up in a warm embrace and let me cry on his shoulder if I need to and just to speak words of blessing over me. It gave me hope that perhaps if this family, and Gary especially, can forgive me, maybe God can forgive me too. And maybe eventually I can forgive myself. In the years since the accident, Shannon has made drastic changes in her life. As a wife and mother, a speaker, and a writer, Shannon shares a passion that was born from the accident that took Marjorie's life. And that is intimacy with Christ. And I know that that passion was born in my heart as a result of carrying Marjorie's legacy. Though she never met Marjorie Jarstfer, it was to her that Shannon dedicated her book, Completely His, Loving Jesus Without Limits. I just felt as if this was my way of, um, of expressing my thanks to her, um, that even though I can't see her, I, I believe that in heaven, I believe that she looks down on us, and I believe that she is pleased on how her husband handled this and um, how it's impacted my life and how I am trying to bring her God glory through the experience. Shannon remains close to Gary, who has since remarried. We've welcomed her into the family just like she was a daughter. While Shannon wishes the Jarsfers had come into her life under different circumstances, she realizes that God works for the good in all situations. I think the desire of my heart for every believer is to understand that there is nothing that you have ever done bad enough to cause God to abandon you. 
or to, or to love you any less. And there is nothing you could ever do in the future that would cause God to love you any less. That our God is unconditionally loving and merciful and compassionate. So that is an amazing, amazing story, is it not? An amazing story of love and forgiveness and transformation and deliverance. You know, think about it. When she was 16, Shannon ran over and killed a woman, okay? If the circumstances had been different, if Gary had not been a Christian, if Marjorie had not been a Christian, and maybe he, he held vengeance and unforgiveness in his heart, Maybe she would have went to jail for a vehicular homicide or, or manslaughter or something like that. Her whole life could have been completely, completely messed up just because of that one big time mess up, that one big time mistake. And yet God knew what he was doing and God's love was in Gary. And Gary wanted to honor his, his wife, Marjorie, and her faith by forgiving Shannon. What, what, and, she, and he said, what would Marjorie have done if, it was, if I was in that place? She would have forgiven Shannon. And so I should do the same thing. And, and it's just amazing. It's just an amazing story of how forgiveness can be so amazing and powerful that they are today, uh, or, you know, recently. And they're friends and they, you know, she's kind of adopted into the family. Uh, he put a commission on her to become the godly woman that his wife was, and she took that and ran with it. She wrote a book called Every Woman's Battle. Uh, it's about dealing with sexual temptation. She wrote like 30 books on, on Christian living and helping, helping, uh, helping people. And so her life was completely transformed in a positive way by this terrible thing because God's forgiveness was shown through Gary and his family to her. So that's an amazing, that's an amazing story. God says this in his word. He says this, and this is amazing too. In Jeremiah 31, 34, he says, I will forgive their sins. This is God speaking. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. This, this is something that we can really take comfort in. When we repent of our sins, we turn to God and say, God, forgive me. He says, I will not remember your sins. Other verses in the Bible said, I will separate your sins from you as far as the east is from the west. I will take your sins and trample them and dump them in the bottom of the ocean and remember them no more. That's what God says. He's not holding this against us. When we come to him, he says, I want to forgive you. I want to forgive you, and I'm not going to hold it against you. So that, that amazing forgiveness is available through God, and it's made available through Christ Jesus, who paid the price for all of our sins on that terrible cross in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. Jesus died and bled, bled and died and spilled his blood to cover our sins. And he says, I want to forgive you. I paid for you. I paid for your sins. I covered you. You're forgiven. Just trust in me. Come to me. Let me be your Savior, let me be your Lord, Jesus says, and your life will be transformed by his amazing love and forgiveness. Just like, obviously, Gary's life was transformed prior to this accident, Shannon's life was transformed by God's love and forgiveness after that accident, and her faith became real, her faith in Christ became real. So this is good to remember, folks, because a lot of times we remember all the things we did, we think God can't forgive us, he can forgive us, and he won't hold us against it, he won't hold it against us. So, we're not that much different, I don't think. We're not that much different than Shannon or the woman caught in adultery. Now, I'm not saying we ran over people and committed adultery, but we've all sinned. Every single one of us has sinned. All have fallen short of God's glory. And the wages of our sin, the result of that sin is that we deserve death. But Christ paid for that, paid for all of our sins, past, present, and future, and he forgave us. And so we need a savior. We all need Jesus. We need him as our savior. We need his redemption and forgiveness. And though we didn't kill anybody, you know, if you've hated somebody, you committed murder in your heart. If you look on someone with lust, you committed adultery in your heart. You know, I've done all those things, you know. I'm no, I'm no different than you. We all have sinned. We're not much different than Shannon 
or the woman in adultery. And we need redemption and we need forgiveness and it's available through Jesus. And then when we receive that, when we, when, when we trust in Jesus, we become a new creation in him. And this is so amazing. Okay, we're tra we get a transformed life because of the love and forgiveness of Jesus. In 2 uh, Corinthians 5, 17, it says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. That's amazing to think of. That's, that's transformation. That's transformation that can only happen through trusting in Jesus and letting him just give you a whole new life, a whole new spirit. You know, I was, I was studying um, the Bible this morning. I was listening to some sermons, and uh, my wife was, was giving me some really great uh, teachings that she had come across. And the, the, the preacher was, was speaking. He said, I don't, he said, God doesn't patch your holes. He doesn't patch your holes. He makes you completely new. He makes you completely new. You know, you can't put new wine in old skins, old wine skins. You know, it's going to burst that out. He gives us a new wine skin. He gives us new wine. He gives us a whole new mind, a whole new spirit, a whole new life in him. And so when we trust in him, the old life is gone and the new life has become. That's the first step, trusting in Jesus and letting him forgive you, letting him transform you. And then when something happens in your life, you can extend the same forgiveness that Jesus gave you, that God extended to you. The Bible says in Ephesians that we should forgive each other just as Christ, as God through Christ has forgiven us. Forgive one another just as God through Christ has forgiven us. And so we don't want to hold on to those burdens of things that are the, the anger, the bitterness of things that people did to us. We want to forgive them just as God has forgiven us. And so that's the message tonight. Forgiveness is huge. Forgiveness is transformational. Forgiveness can change the world, can change uh, the most horrible relationships, the most dire situations. Forgiveness from God can, can change all of that, can change the most terrible situation as we saw uh, in the story of the woman in the well, of the woman at the, uh, uh, excuse me, the woman caught in adultery and in Shannon. Those lives are transformed. Forgiveness was a key factor and the forgiveness of God can give you to change you too. And when we extend that forgiveness, we become God's instrument in, in, in his love and his transform, transformational power across the world. So that's the message tonight. I want you to think about forgiveness. Think about how you've been forgiven. Maybe think about things you're not forgiving yourself for, but God has. Maybe think about grudges that you're holding that God wants you to release and forgive. And watch what happens when you allow his forgiveness just to flow through you. Transformations are going to be wild. I guarantee that. So let's pray, and then we're going to get to our small uh, Zoom groups. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you so much that forgiveness is available through Christ Jesus. He paid it all once and for all on the cross. His blood paid for our mess-ups, our mistakes, our errors, our sins, all of that stuff against you. The things that were dragging us down, Christ paid for those. The things that were separating us from you, Christ paid for those. Thank you for your love, Lord Jesus, and thank you for forgiving us. That mighty act allows us to stand before you boldly and confidently. And so, Lord, we thank you that you've forgiven us. We thank you that you don't remember our sins. You, 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 you block them out of your memory. You separate them from us as far as the east is from the west. You put them in the bottom of the sea. Help us, Lord, to forgive ourselves. Help us to trust in your forgiveness, your ultimate forgiveness of us. And then, Lord, help us to extend that forgiveness to those who have wronged us or hurt us over the, over the years, over our lives. Help us to extend that forgiveness to people around us. And, Lord, I just pray that as we forgive those who trespass against us, those sinned against us, as we forgive those people around us, that your transformational power of, of your love and your forgiveness just blows through uh, hardened hearts and, and transforms lives around us. So Lord, use us as instruments of your love, as instruments of your forgiveness in this world. And so that's, that's the message tonight, Lord. Help us to take that to heart and not just in our heads, but to live that out 
help us to live that out every day in, in our entire life, lives. So, Lord, help us. We love you. We thank you. We thank you again for your forgiveness. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.